So here we go. There's 501 active listings in Fulton County right now. And last week at this time, there was 474. That's a, that's a good sign. We have more active listings sitting on the market. We had 510 two weeks ago. I think we're holding some inventory, uh, which I think is a good thing. Uh, we saw 420 go pending, uh, 164 get active under contract, and 300 uh, closed. So in, inside that number, if you kind of look, if here's the beginning of the year, we had the first week of the year, which we expected a climb, but we've just kind of held steady. Um, so I don't think that's a good thing or a bad thing. I think it just means uh, the listings are holding. Um, the closings went down a little bit. They typically do in the middle of the month. The contracts went up a little bit. Um, they typically do in the middle of the month. All's good in, in numbers in Fulton County. DeKalb County, we're looking at 287 active on the market, a little more than last week a little more than the week before that, a lot more than the week before that. So actually the inventory, the blue line in DeKalb County is climbing, which is good. 243 pending, 172 closed. We're kind of holding our own in numbers here. What we're really, really, really hoping for is the, the market to take off when it comes to inventory. And we just haven't seen it yet. It's supposed to happen. We haven't seen it yet. So we're waiting on uh, the market to take off historically. And I mean history, not like as in the last two years, but prior to that, the spring market usually took off mid-February, late February, and then we would really be cranking by March. And if you sold real estate for any number of years, you probably remember that slow January. And then by mid-February, everybody was feeling good. And by March, everybody was riding high. It feels like that kind of year. Now, that feels weird to us because the last two years, it started off flying high uh, in January. And we're just not feeling that right now. Now, in contrast, though, your buyers are very hot demand right now. They're, they're heated. They want to buy houses. They're raring and ready to go. We just don't have the inventory to sell them just yet, but it's coming. And that's what I want to make sure you understand. So 310, I'm in Cobb County, 260 a week before in active listings, 319 the week before that, 236 pending, and 198 closings. Same kind of story. We're if you take the cursor, if you can see my cursor and kind of go back, we went down at the end of November. We just haven't recovered in the volume of active listings or even the volume of pending or the volume of closings we were doing even in October last year. So here's, here's what you need to know. That's pretty doggone normal. And it's just not normal as in the last two years, but it was pretty doggone normal from years past. So nobody panic. I used to make a joke as a, a team leader. All my top agents would come into my office in January crying, wondering if their business was ever going to start. And by February, you couldn't even get on their calendar for a cup of coffee because they were busy. It happens every year. So just know it's normal and seasonal. Here's the reminder. Uh, if you go to the website, www.therealestatestats.com, it takes you directly to this spreadsheet. You can look at the numbers anytime you want. Um, okay, so let's go into some stuff here. Um, I wanna make sure we start with a little education first. So there's this thing called the 10-year treasury note. And the 10-year treasury note is the most closely related to mortgage interest rates in the stock market. So this is a leading indicator, if you understand the vernacular, uh, to interest rates. 
But if you go back and look at the 10 year treasury note over the last three years, let me get my cursor off here so we can see. Um, back in early 2019, the 10 year treasury note was trending close to 3%. And then it went down by uh, the spring market of 2020, i.e. the pandemic. And that's when all the interest rates took off for us. That's where we were seeing 2.75 interest. People were refinancing and buying things with twos in front of it. Um, and, and the 10 year treasury was that leading indicator. Well, you're starting to see that two year treasury. It started to creep up in 2021. And then you can see this peak right here at 1.79% on January 9th. So all the early talk of 2022 was that the interest rates were going to climb and we expect them to climb. But you can see it actually kind of creeped back down for a minute um, there at the end. And if we go, let's look at this over the last five days. Over the last five days, it's creeped back down. So in theory, interest rates should creep back down just slightly right now. Um, but remember, we're talking 0.2% of a point in treasury yield that directly affects interest rates, eh, a little bit. It's a leading indicator. You should study it. Any comments or questions? Uh, I don't know if Carl made it on or not. Thoughts, questions, comments? All right, we'll move on. So here's an interesting question. Of course, it doesn't want to open for me now. All right, this, this uh, ever familiar Peloton stock. So if you look at Peloton over the last three years, it looks like a mountain. It, it went uh, early pandemic. Everybody went home, bought Peloton bikes. The stock went sky high. And then the stock is crashing right now. And, and it's way back down. So does this mean America thinks the pandemic's over? I think I'm being a little uh, tongue in cheek and asking the question. It's a little optimistic, but at the end of the day, um, it feels like uh, we're gonna have a good year um, about people in, in the economy. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, but anyway, tongue in cheek about the Peloton. Toya. Yes. Hello. How are you? I am awesome. I am awesome. I think Carl is going to join us as well. I know that he uh, is looking forward to sharing on some insights. So, all right. Well, all we're right. rocking and rolling. So, yeah. Here's the big question is this stock market. Mm. And uh, what I would tell you is the stock market is related to the real estate industry, but not directly, meaning your high net worth clients, if their, their stock portfolios go down 20, 30%, they're pretty used to it, but it certainly shakes them up with client uh, confidence, right? Consumer confidence. Um, your lower net worth individual clients are probably not as affected, but remember most people's retirement sits in the stock market. So yep. their 401ks, their IRAs, all, all the, the money they're taking from their corporate job and they're putting it into some kind of, uh, of stock market backed uh, fund, if you will. And if the stock market gets a little shaky this year, I don't think it's necessarily gonna directly affect the real estate industry. But I will tell you there will be individual cases where people's confidence gets shaken up by the stock market in 2022. It's inevitable. A lot I of agree. it is it's tech stocks, yep, but yep. He, here's the weird stuff. And you know, uh, um, international media, international news affects our stock market. So if Russia ends up invading Ukraine in the next month, it'll shake up our stock market. And what does that necessarily do to the real estate industry? 
I think it'll keep our interest rates low. And I think the demand for houses is so high right now. And the inventory is just not there that no matter what happens uh, with the stock market or interest rates climbing, I think we're set up to have an, a, a killer year in real estate. And I'm happy to debate that, but that's my prediction is I almost feel like we're a little insulated from things that could really in normal years affect our market where right now people have been begging to buy houses. So I'm pretty confident in that. All right. So we're going to stay on the stock market for a minute. So and Toya, Brett, like, yeah, go ahead. The only thing that I would add to that is I do believe that there may just be some correlation with, you know, when you're thinking of well, what's affordable housing look like now? Um, people who are looking at the stock market, they're looking at their 401ks, they're looking at other places where they can get money. And so if they're not feeling real comfortable about their investments, that may slow us down just a little bit. However, I think you're right. Interest rates, I think, are going to stay um, low, although we have seen an uptick. So it'll be interesting to kind of see what the other countries are doing and, and where we will fall with that. Well, here's the irony of this conversation, Toya, is people might lose 10, 20 percent value in the stock market this year, or they could. You know, I'm not predicting that, but I think it could happen, right? Yeah. Um, you know what they're not losing 10 to 20 percent value in? Equity, home equity. <laughs> Real estate. Yes. So if our agents aren't figuring or connecting the dots, around how helping people move money into the real estate holdings. Um, real estate holdings is becoming one of the biggest hot uh, net worth, wealth building, growth opportunity. And it used to look like it was the barrier of entry was so great. But we have learned as an industry over the years, if you want to invest in real estate, we'll figure out how to help you do that whether it's in some kind of fund or uh, you buy your first house, live in it for two years, buy your next house, keep the same one, hard money lending. You know, there's all kinds of ways to help people invest in real estate. And we should be experts at that. I agree. Because the stock market is interesting because it does tell us a lot of things. So this article is talking about home builder stocks are a sell, get rid of them. Inflation's hurting home builders. And it's really uh, it's creating a concern around some of the big production builders. Um, and it's really just because of inflation and supply chain and, and all the above, right? So inflation concerns, subsequent interest rate hikes by the Federal Reserves are a negative factor. They, they really think the home builders, while 2021 kind of felt pretty good for them, they're going to probably struggle a little bit in 2022. What do you think? I agree. I think we are seeing slowdown in our uh, new construction. Um, we also have seen incredible hikes um, for people that are building if it's not a spec home and they can't close on it immediately. So I always say, you know who the best uh, people are to home, to sell homes or those that are the, the ones that are already living in one. Um, usually if there's not a whole lot of repairs or anything of that nature, that is a win-win. And so you don't have to worry about is the lumber price going to go up? You know, what are the rates doing for the builders and how much money are they actually getting? Because they are tied to a lot that's happening. So I think this is just another opportunity to talk with our sellers and people in our database is that, you know, hey, they're the hot commodity right now to sell their property. Yeah, 100%. Activities is everything. Um, yeah. But, you know, it's just kind of interesting because these builders, if their stock price takes a hit, what does the board of directors do? Uh, they're going to want that return because everywhere else in the real estate industry is thriving. And it'll be interesting to, to keep an eye on the builders in 2022. All right. Um, this is interesting. So remember, I said the stock market is, is related to our industry, but it's not exactly directly related. Well, 
when they say offer pads market cap slips below 1 billion, that means on the stock market, offer pad is, is valued at a billion dollars. And, uh, and, and it's gone backwards. Well, I find the whole iBuyer thing very interesting. And we were on a call on Friday, I think it Friday. was. Yeah, where they were talking about how Atlanta is like the hotbed for institutional investing. And if I'm being honest, it has me a little bit nervous. I'm not concerned, but uh, certainly want to keep my eye on it because here's what I've paid attention to over the years. People know that big wealth is, is created through real estate. And that means institutional investors know that too. And if you think back, Toya, um, 10 years ago, you used to pull up searches in the MLS and you would actually see real foreclosures in the MLS. Like it was a bank owned property listed in the MLS. And it was kind of a joke because your buyers would all call you and say, hey, I want a foreclosure. I, I want a deal, right? And, but we would actually look and there was, you would find foreclosures. Well, the big institutional investors figured out they could go to these banks and buy packages of property for big money. And you actually saw the foreclosures stop coming actually to the MLS. We don't see a lot of foreclosures in the MLS anymore. That doesn't mean they're not there. It just means they're never coming to the MLS. Well, market's been so good, equity's been so good. Um, those big institutional investors are not buying those big packages from the banks any longer because there's not a lot of REO property out there right now. So what are they doing is they're actually going to these iBuyer companies and moving their money there. And they're buying blocks of houses from Zillow, blocks of houses from OfferPad, blocks of houses from open door and those houses are never coming back to the MLS and it, it's part of our inventory issue um, but the other part of this Toya that I just make mention of is those big institutional investing companies they used to have all their money in commercial real estate they'd own the building downtown they'd own the shopping mall um, commercial real estate still is a great part of our industry but it's not as lucrative they found out as residential real estate is in, in, in big form, right? Buying a hundred houses at a time kind of thing. So a lot of that money is being shifted around from commercial to residential. And it's just interesting to watch. Here's the downside. You just took 20% of our inventory from us. And now we're all feeling it because we're out here trying to find houses to sell and some of those houses just never came back to us, right? What do you make Absolutely. of that? Point? So, you know, love iBuyers or hate iBuyers, they are here in our market. And what has been interesting to watch is to see how they have really put together a value proposition, not just to the hedge funds, but also to the direct consumer, the direct sellers. So I think it is something that we need to take a look at because I, when the days of when I started in real estate, it was truly just the traditional companies and it was really about knowing your market, farming your market. But I do think that there are opportunities in order for us to be able um, to get in front of some of these things. Because if I look at market share, I think when we spoke last Friday um, in Cobb County, I do believe one of the agents mentioned that there was 15 to almost 20% market share um, from one of the iBuyers. And so we have to look at them buying and selling. Uh, what are they doing in order to capture the market? Are they turning it back around, putting it, you know, looking at our sellers, but they're working with these big investors who are taking a lot of the properties sight unseen. So here's what I would say to that. The solution to me is always know your competition, always know how you can strategize against that. Because although these, uh, you know, hedge funds are buying them blind. That means we just have to strengthen our skill sets. This is a true skill set market. And so building those relationships with the other uh, realtor associates, networking, all of those things, um, when it comes to just comparing, you know, apples to apples, sometimes they'll, you'll, they'll choose somebody else because they can take it right off the market. But we have great programs, particularly with KW, 
that will help us win a lot of these bids. Yeah, I hate to call it what it is, but uh, I think our industry as agents, we got lazy, me, you know, and we, yeah, we got out of, of touch with our, our relationships of our database. And if we were in deep relationship with the people in our database, it wouldn't be like this. They would have known we had the options. They would have known we could do all that. So I, I think iBuyers is certainly a thing of the future and certainly a thing of now. But I also think, Toya, I think city regulation, you know, and I think HOA regulation is going to be a very real thing in the future. And what I mean yep. by that is there's a lot of cities that put rental, like mm -hmm. a lot of rental rules on companies and things like and that. Caps. And, and caps. caps. And, uh, you know, when I'm helping an investor, or I'm an investor wanting to buy a rent house. I don't like that. But the reality is, as a real estate professional, that may end up protecting me later. Absolutely. Same thing with HOAs. They don't let uh, too, more than a certain percentage become mm -hmm. leased out or whatever. And uh, That is correct. You know, on one side of the fence, that you're, you're annoyed. On the other side of the fence, on the industry side, that could turn out to be a really good thing, protecting from a lot of the big institutional people coming in and, and, yep. and really... I don't want to say to create a separation of class, but they're not buying the high end stuff. They're buying the low end stuff. So and they're getting and yeah. they're getting it before we ever realize that it's been gone. That that's where it comes into uh, affordability, the affordable housing. They are truly taking that right off the shelves. Yeah. Which just leads into this article in the Atlanta Business Chronicle. It says report shows home affordability continues to decline in Atlanta. I'm not surprised. Price is going up, which means it's more expensive. Interest rates are going up. Income's kind of flat. And, uh, you know, not in our industry, but in, in, in median income in, in the city of Atlanta is not really trending the same way as, as, as prices and interest rates are, are going. So it's going to shrink the affordability in the city. By the way, we're not the only city dealing with this. This is a pretty oh, no. common uh, pr common thing going on around the country. And, you know, you look at the great resignation and you look at all this. And at the end of the day, uh, uh, all the great affordability we've experienced over the last couple of years, uh, it's just slowly shrinking a little bit. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because it puts wealth in one pocket, but takes affordability out of another. Make sense? It does. And I think that there's the opportunity to have the conversation uh, in terms of looking for um, other ways for people to maybe really see where they have money. They may not know that they have money um, stuck away in, you know, an insurance policy, or they may not know that, you know, so much is in their 401k, the power of that. So I do believe that this is an opportunity, as well as for builders and developers uh, to look at that as well. So I think we may see some um, great changes that come in pockets in the areas where they can do affordability, because again, that is a market that has a need. There you go. So I want to go back to something real quick. And this is a slide, and let me see if I can make it bigger here. Oh, that did not make it bigger. Um, okay, so this slide talks about these power buyers. And power buyers is not a super common term, but it's it's a term we've been talking about. And basically, there, there's two reasons I see people really engaging these power buyers. One is your seller says to you, Toya, I'd sell my house, but I have nowhere to go. I don't want to go fight the crazy market. Da, 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 da. Well, a power buyer gives you the opportunity to go buy the next house for cash. And then you can sell your current house later. So it actually puts you into action now around that transition of moving. Um, you certainly are going to pay for that service, but it's part of the deal right now. And just work it into the deal. And the second part I see people really engaging these power buyers around is if they're in one of those markets where cash is king, you can't win unless you're dealing with, you're, you're fighting big cash offers. Um, 
I think the power buyer removes the uh, contingency of financing out, out of your negotiating stance and allows you to come to the table and negotiate as if you were a cash buyer. And then you can turn around and uh, put the loan on it second. So I think these companies are starting to kind of really uh, come into play. But I find this interesting. The comment they made in this article was long-term outcome dependent, long-term outcome dependent on how long low inventory persists. So I think this is a niche mar park, ugh, a niche product that is going to hang around until our industry moves to a more balanced market. And the question I, is, when we're in a balanced market, do you really need that? You're probably not going to need it unless you just it, unique. I would agree. We uh, we talk a lot about these power buyers and just the programs that are available. The one thing that I would say is the associates and agents really need to know the ins and out of these programs. We're finding once they get to the closing table. Sometimes the buyers don't know all about the programs because the agents, and so we always say we like to stay in our lane, but this is where we have to, again, become the consultant. If we're going to recommend any of these companies, we really do need to know what the fee is because there is going to be a fee. Is the interest rate going to change? How much money more? How much more money do they need to bring outside of their earnest money, just so that they're clear on the terms? There's so many of these popping up. Ribbon is one. Another one. I don't see it on the list, but there are so many. And so, as we are utilizing these tools, I think you're right, Brett. We're seeing them for the market of the moment, and this is still the market of the moment. We've been doing this now for about two years, using these companies heavily. Uh, yet what I am finding is sometimes our agents don't know all of the ins and out, and they're not able to really advise or consult with their clients to really explain the process. So sure, they have their place for sure. Well, this is, this is a fiduciary duty conversation. Yes, and it is. And this is a professionalism conversation, and this is a uh, skills conversation. You should know the skills of what all this is. So you're advising your clients appropriately. Yep, um, yep. The other thing I thought was really interesting is if you look at the population growth of Atlanta, we went from 5.3 in 2010 to 6.1 in 2020 to 15% population growth over the last 10 years where the US was experiencing a 7% growth which just says this is a pretty doggone good place to live and sell real estate, Toya, is what that says. It says, also says we're in the land of opportunity right here in Atlanta. So, you know, when we're thinking about migration patterns and we're thinking about investments, um, those are things that we can be talking about to friends and family that live in other places. Because I think about my family that lives in California for the same square footage that they would pay, you know, there and here, we're in two different worlds. So um, even investment opportunities are here, especially if we're helping our clients with wealth building. Yep. So I like it. Uh, medium price is just cranking up. As a, Atlanta area is at $360,000. Um, so it's kind of crazy. You can imagine what you bought your first house for compared yep. to what somebody's yep. buying their first house for today. And it blows your mind. But anyway, Toya, tell me what, what are the talking points this week that I need to bring back to my business? I would say, you know, the biggest thing is, um, and I love the speaker that we had last uh, last Friday, um, really just talking about going out, still creating our inventory. There's no, we already know what to do. We know how to do it, but really just getting in front of and staying in constant communication and touching our database. Um, we know that that's really what we should be doing. However, many of us are guilty that we may not be doing that at a very high level. The other part is really there are so many programs that you can pair with what you're doing. So the ones that you set just showed, uh, in addition to that, just really being able to educate our clients on other options. And that's all they're looking for are options. Yeah. And here's the thing I would just remind us all. 
we may make a statement that says we have low inventory, but the truth is, if I would get into activity with the people that I have a relationship with, I could create my own reality. And it's all based on what activity I'm willing to do. And, that, and that's how professionals think. And I will leave everyone with that thought today. Happy Monday. Thank you. Happy Bye. Monday. Thank you.